with all the candy, be true, be mine, all the candies at Walmart as soon as Christmas was over, Valentine Day comes in, and all about this love stuff, you know, and you got to buy roses and candy and 1-800-Flowers and 1-800-Candy and all this kind of stuff. And guys, if you forget your wives on Thursday, at least most of them, you know, you're in the doghouse for a week or two. Okay, and so it's, uh, it's, it's a big day where we get caught up in love, we get caught up in love, and I thought today we have, I, would, I would speak on love, but not the love, the gushy, emotional love that, that everybody's caught up in and to spend a whole bunch of money we don't have, okay, on Thursday. That's not what the, the love I want to talk about is, is sincere love, the same love that a husband should have for his wife a godly, Christ-like love. And church, uh, I, I want us to think about something. <coughs> now, Brandon, I want you to do something for me. I want you to log out of that, and I want you to go and click the Internet. I want you to go right to the Internet, go right to my home page. Yeah, minimize that, brother. Minimize that, and click the Internet Explorer. I'm excited. That picture is about to have an addition. All right, and I want you to scroll down. Just scroll down. No, scroll down, brother. Yeah, scroll on down. Okay, there's good. Just there's good. Now, church. Now, I want everybody to notice we are at Facebook. Okay? Now, the things that we're putting on Facebook is not proving our real love for God. And we could, and this is just my, my page, there's one of my political buddies right there who's, please be praying, he, uh, his father went lost during the blizzard, um, and I believe they, they found him, uh, there he is, uh, Mr. Cushing, uh, he's the senator from Bangor, Maine senator from Bangor, thank you for all your prayers and support during this difficult time, but the, the point I wanted to show is, is we're getting into a time now to where we're revealing our heart through agencies such as Facebook. But what's already there, God already knows. We can't in one breath say that we love God, in the next breath put a picture of us barely in our outside of our birthday suits, or even our young people. I bet my heart's been broken from the teen clubs. One minute in church, the next moment where there's not supposed to be alcohol, but they get it into those teen clubs somewhere or another, and then a picture ends up on Facebook. And, 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 and all these other things that, that, are, that are happening all over. And church, we really have to take, take call a time out and ask ourselves, do we really, really love God? And Valentine's week is a great week to do that. Because you have hearts everywhere you look. You know, maybe, you'll, maybe this week the kids at school will get the little Valentine party and the little, you know, I remember the uh, little um, Bugs Bunny, the Looney Tune cards or the He-Man cards or Power Ranger cards and all those little cards are exchanged. You know, the Valentine cards. Okay, that's right, Tony, that's right. Now we got to ask ourselves the question, have we sent God a card? Have, have we talked to Him in a loving way? In church, the Bible says in 1 John, the Bible says in one breath we cannot say, I love God, and the next breath goes something else. Church, we're seeing things before our very eyes where folks at one moment are hungry for God, and the next moment God's given the leftovers. And here's the, the, what we're going to talk about today. Brandon, you can go back in, brother, to the PowerPoint. What we're going to talk about here today is a love for God, or a love for mammon or the world. And I pray everybody here, if we don't already love God, especially on Communion Sunday, when we, when we take part in one of the early institutions of the church, Jesus instituted Himself. He will institute again in heaven. But do we, do we fully, fully, fully love God from the depths of our heart? Or are we just playing games? Playing games. You know what breaks my heart is when I go down through a Facebook and I see someone and they were right here lifting up hands at the altar wanting to raise their children 
in a godly fashion. In the next moments, a picture that's very displeasing to God. Church, in a day of social networking and where our business is everybody's business, we put everything on Facebook now. People put their dirty laundry. If you've been following, there's the whole, whole mess about the, the uh, Oxford Hills uh, Christian Academy problem that they're having with, with, uh, with administration. It's all over Facebook and people talking and all that stuff. Yes, Facebook is good. We're on Facebook. We'll record right now and go on Facebook. It's very good. But some of the things are not because we, we just want to share our heart right away. We lose self-control. But when we do those things, we, we forget who we're loving. We're for, we forget who we're to have as the top example. If you guys would be so kind as to stand with me for the reading of God's Word here today, from Luke chapter 16. Luke chapter 16, and this is the parable of the unjust stewards. And we're going to read the first 13 verses here today. Luke chapter 16. Luke is the third book of the New Testament if you're looking for it. If you cannot find it, it will be on the screen for you. And if you cannot see that, then feel free just to listen with your ears. Luke 16, beginning with the first verse, and I'll be reading from the New King James Version of the Bible. He also said to his disciples, there was a certain rich man who had a steward. And an accusation was brought to him that this man was wasting his goods. So he called him and said to him, what is this I hear about you? Give an account of your stewardship, for you can no longer be steward. Then the steward said within himself, What shall I do? For my master is taking the stewardship away from me. I cannot dig. I am ashamed to beg. I have resolved what to do, that when I am put out of the stewardship, they may receive me into their houses. So he called every one of his master's debtors to him and said to the first, How much do you owe my, owe my master? And he said, A hundred measures of oil. So he said to him, Take your bill, sit down quickly, and write fifty. Then he said to another, And how much do you owe? So he said, A hundred measures of wheat. And he said to him, Take your bill, and write eighty. So the master commended the unjust steward, because he had dealt truly, for the sons of this world are more shrewd in their generation than the sons of light. And I say to you, Make friends for yourselves, bond righteous mammon. And when you fail, they may receive you into ever, an everlasting home. He who is faithful in what is least is faithful also in much. And he who is unjust in what is least is also unjust in, in much. Therefore, if you have done uh, therefore, if you have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, who will commit to your trust the true riches? And if you have been if you have not been faithful in what is another man's who will give you what is your own? No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other, for you cannot serve God and mammon. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of his word. You may be seated. Church stewardship simply means a manager of something. If you're a Christian here today, your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. You have a responsibility to manage your body, your heart, and the blessings that God has given you. You have a responsibility beyond all to take care of the great things God has blessed us with. Now here, church, is a great illustration of an unjust steward. A steward who was careless. A steward who did not understand his responsibility. A steward that was, that was to the point of being fired. But also the steward understood he needed to make a change. He needed to turn things around. He needed to, to set things straight. He needed to stop going the wrong way. And church, God has given us authority in Jesus' name to overcome anything. Church, we are more than conquerors in Jesus' name. How many times do you have to hear that verse? How many times do you have to hear that verse before we'll actually believe that we can be Christ-like in our, in our ways of life? But church, I really love this story, not because of the unjust steward, but what the unjust steward does when reality sets in. 
And so you have to ask yourself the question before we get into this message. Again, how much do you love God? Teenagers, how much do you love God? Adults, how much do you love God? Seniors, how much do you love God? Okay, and if and you say, Pastor, I hope you don't go to my Facebook because I, I, I'd be ashamed if I saw that pop up there. If I went down and said, okay, let's check this person out, check that, and just read the language that's there. Or maybe a, a post that we liked or a picture that's there. And we like, let me just say some church, if you like a picture, what that does, it feeds advertising, it feeds other pictures. The next thing you know, you've got somebody popping up in the birthday suit, and you're thinking, I didn't like that, how'd that get there? How's everybody seeing that on my wall? Or, or, or whatever the case may be. But church, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth is speaking. Whether that's an audible form, or whether that's in written form. Okay, and it's proving our love for the Lord or lack of love for the Lord. But the problem is, one's history does not have to be their destiny. You can turn things around. We're going to find here the unjust steward. He turned things around. He realized, he realized that his love was of money and of investing and robbing what truly belonged to his boss. Had his hand in the jar. Okay, and sometimes we do that when we work. We take some church, you do the same thing. If you go in and you're supposed to clock your time, but oh, it's a half hour early, I'm just going to leave early, the boss is gone, she'll never know. You know what? That's robbing your employer of what belongs to them. An eight hour day, you're, you're worth an eight hour, of labor's worth is wages. But if you only do a seven hour day, but clock eight hours, somebody's cheating. That's not good, but that's dishonoring God. Pastor, how's that dishonoring God? Because we're temples of the Holy Spirit. How is that going to look in one moment? You invite somebody to church, and the next moment you're called into the office because you've been robbing the place of employment of a couple of hours. Happens a lot. We do it in taxes. We do it in a lot of ways. We shortchange. Some folks are so conniving where, you know, they'll go to a farm and they're supposed to get, you know, 50 pounds of potatoes and actually throw an extra 10 pounds in the bag and say, oh, it's 50. All that's robbing God. In church, God, uh, we've, we're, we've talked about that here at Praise. God's revealing the truth. And who people robbing from God, things are developing, church. God does not like thievery. It's one of the Ten Commandments. Thou shalt not steal. Okay, but there are so many. And that's just a couple examples. But you know what? Let's turn it around. Let's flip the coin. Church, it's sad. When I have to go to Facebook, and I, and I talk to folks, of course, sending messages when, I, when I'm concerned about something or whatever. But then I, sometimes I have, to, I have to either just remove them from my chat line, because I don't want that garbage out there for my nephew to see. Or people, people check, check out what I have on there every day just to see what I write. Try to put an encouraging word on there every day. I don't want Brandon to be, he's a Facebook fanatic. I don't want him on Facebook and say, wow, Pastor's got this picture right here. What in the world's going on in his mind? Maybe he gets to it before I can get to it. Maybe, you know, somebody has sent up, somebody posts something on my wall. Someone posts, and sometimes, you know, I work with a lot of different people. Sometimes they do it as a joke. They'll post something on my wall, and before I see it, the whole world has seen it. Just a joke, just a tease. Just to get a good laugh at the pastor. Or whatever the case may be. Alright? And so, God wants us to seriously do some deep thinking. This Valentine's week, how much we love Him. How much we love Him. Verse number 1 of chapter 16 of the Gospel of Luke. He also said to His disciples, Jesus here preaching, the rest of the words are all in red. If you have a red lettered edition version of the Bible. There was a certain rich man who had a steward. Now, it was very common for rich folks, just like today, who have accountants, have people handle their money. Okay, in my home, well, honey, I guess we handle it together, you know, which is the way it should be in a married couple. And she just tells me what bills to write out, and I write them. That's usually how it rolls. Every now and then I might buy myself something, but not too much. But ask yourself the question. Every, we all have a steward of some kind. If we're married, it's usually our wife, mm -hmm. you know, but who, who tells us with Tim's back and, oh, yeah, mm -hmm. about that. <laughs> and, uh, like Vince says, I wear the pants, but Tracy tells me which one to wear. So that's the, way, that's the way it rolls. But here we have the rich man who had a steward. Okay? And, 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 as a, and an accusation was brought to the rich man 
that the steward or this man was wasting his goods. You know what, church? Ask yourself this question. If you were to go before the Lord today and the accusations would be drawn in your name, you go before, and we're all going to face Jesus in the judgment seat of Christ, or the, uh, or at the hopefully not the great white throne. I hope we're all believers here, but if you're not, you're going to ju you'll be judged by the Lord of what's called the, the great white throne judgment, which I'm going to be studying next week, uh, Revelation. If you want to come next week, that's next week's lesson. Tonight we're going to be talking about thousand-year reign of Christ, Satan bound a thousand years till then, five o'clock. Come on out, we'd love to have you. But church, any accusations that would go your way to God? I'm going to say, well, Pastor, that, I think that person, you know, he does rob his, his place of business. You know, he's, he's not supposed to take bottled water home, but he takes it home from work and gives it to his kids or, or whatever the case, the case may be. Uh, there are a lot of things. People get real, real. when I worked at the crab house back in the day, uh, my first job, you know, folks were taking crabs all the time, hoping that the manager never would see it. You know, we're taking hamburger or chicken and fixing up grilled cheeses on and didn't pay for it. And maybe that's why we went out of business. But uh, it wasn't good stewardship, that's for sure. But here an accusation was brought against the steward. Now we're going to find that this accusation proved to be valid. It proved to be a valid accusation. Church, we're known by our fruits. The truth is going to find itself out one way or another. Okay? And here... The accusation was brought forth to the rich man that his goods were being wasted. Think about this. If you are a business owner, okay, you're a business owner and you find out that somebody, let's say, let's say you're an excav excavating business and, and, you, and you sell a lot of dirt from a gravel pit or gravel or whatever the case may be. And let's say you find out somebody that you're paying is taking a few truckloads a week on your dime. What's your response going to be? Oh, sure, no problem. That's just a couple hundred dollars. That's no problem. Money grows on trees. I have a feeling something's going to jump into you and it's not going to be the Holy Ghost. Somebody's robbing from you. You're not going to be happy. Here, this, this boss is not going to be happy. Verse 2, so he called him. The, the rich man called the steward and said to him, What is this I hear about you? Give an account of your stewardship. semi going. Okay, so the accusation has been brought forth, and the rich man wants to know what's going on. Wants to know what's happening. Now, in the, in the New King James and in the, the translation I have, or the publishing I have, which is the Thomas Nelson, has a semicolon. Your Bible may have a colon, it may have a comma, but it, it says, What is this I hear? Give an account of your stewardship. God's going to do the same thing to us. Give an account of our life. Okay? And then it says, for you no longer, you can no longer be steward. Which means he's fired. This behavior, it doesn't give the reply, it just gives a space. But it says you can no longer be steward. This guy is going to lose his job. Reality is setting in. And so right now, church, I, just stop and think. If God was to ask you, what have you been doing? Or maybe even ask you the question, do you love me? Jesus asked Peter the question several times. Do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? Jesus was looking for an agape. Jesus was looking for an, an unconditional, drop your nets and follow me love. Dry, and, and of course, you know, feed my sheep, feed my lambs, you know, that type of thing. Jesus knew where Peter's heart was. It wasn't Pentecost yet when Peter got really turned around. All right, but Jesus knows where our heart is too. He knows if we love Him. He knows right now who's receiving this message and who's tuning me out and going in one ear and out the other and thinking about Fourth of or the Valentine's Day or football's over, so basketball this afternoon or college basketball, especially is the next popular sport. March Madness be setting in soon. Pitchers and catchers report next week too. Maybe you're getting into baseball mood. You're ready to start talking Red Sox. But church. He said you can no longer be stewards. Verse 3, then the steward said within himself, so as the steward is getting rebuked, he's starting to think, what can I do? How can I change this, my, my boss's mind? Maybe you're sitting out there thinking too. Uh-oh, I hope pastor's not going to support about everybody here about the Facebook. I could tell some of you would get kind of worried if your Facebook pages were coming up. I could tell. I could tell when I looked out there. Uh-oh. You know, but think about this. Think about this, church. 
Maybe, you're, maybe God's already speaking to you. And so what are you going to do? Here we're going to find repentance start to take place, I believe, in the unjust steward's mind here. He's got to do something and think fast. He's got to be, he's got to recoup. He's got to do something to, to get back in good graces with his boss. You know what you're, don't you want to be in good graces with God? I don't want to be displeasing God in any aspect of my life. I want, to, I want God to, I long to hear, well done, good and faithful servant. We're not perfect, nobody is. Sure, Lord, I'm sorry, but you know what? Let's let's flip the coin. Let's change things. Let's let's get you know. Let's straighten up and start to fly right, you know, and turn things around and, and start to to go in the right direction. But he said in verse three, then the steward said within himself, Jesus speaking again, What shall I do? For my master is taking the stewardship away from me. He's firing me. I cannot dig, and I am ashamed to beg. This guy's losing his livelihood. Because Jesus and the love of the Lord is, 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 is not there because, because his, he's been robbing the master. He hasn't been a good steward. And how am I going to make a living? Some of you may be thinking, well, how am I going to make a living? Because, you know, I'm too proud to beg and this is, my, this is my trade and maybe my trade's illegal trade. Or maybe if I go and confess that I've been robbing my time card, you know, if, uh, you know, if, I, if I go in and, and I'm going to go, to, I feel convicted, Pastor, so I'm going to go tell my boss I've been robbing four hours or five hours a week from my time card. You know what? You might get fired. But you know what? You've got a clean conscience. You have God's favor on your life. Maybe your finances will turn around. Can you imagine? Church, if you rob your place of employment, you're robbing God. It's not loving God. What kind of behavior is that? Shortchanging God. It's the same, it's the same as not tithing. Yeah, Pastor, I, I, I give to God. It's, well, if you, if you give to God, but you're taking away from your employer, God's thinking that money is not really first fruits. You've shortchanged God. It's not loving me. The book of Proverbs says we'll be known by our name. Is when people say your name, do they think of a person of integrity? But here, this, this, the church, the stewards say, what am I going to do? I don't have a trade. This is all I know is, is how to manage money. I'm going down, I'm going down fast. Verse 4, I have resolved what to do. That when I am put out of the stewardship, they may receive me into their houses. Okay, so he's thinking, what am I going to do? Yeah, this person may take me, that person may take me. But you know what, church? You know what I found? That when I go through a downtime of life, when things were tough, 2004 was probably the hardest year of Mary and I's time together, hardest year of ministry, no doubt. But you know what? I found there were very few that came around when we were down in the valley low. Very few. I find much more people coming around me when we're doing a little bit better. And here, this, this steward's thinking, where am I going to go? Who's going to take care of me? How about God? How about God, church? God, God's going to meet your need. But if you, you've got to love Him with all that you have. You've got to have Him as number one priority in your life. I can't stress that enough. Satan is trying to seek, kill, and destroy. He is roaming like a roaring lion. He's desiring to destroy you eternally. But God is there. But you've got to love God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength. Church, difficult things are going to come. Yes, a snowstorm may come on Saturday and you may lose a weekend day. But quite frankly, do you think God would be satisfied with if you went there and said, well, Lord, I lost my Saturday, so, uh, so I'm just going to stay home today. Church, I'm not buying that, to be honest with you. I'm not. I'm not buying it. I believe if God is the top love of our life, we're not going to miss a date with Him. I believe that. I, I really do. I really do. I, I believe that. I can't stress enough. I wonder if we went back to Facebook. How many are on Facebook right now? You know on Facebook, and this gets people into trouble, it says the times... You go on there, the things you play, it's another thing, games. But it says when you're, it's like a fingerprint. 
God does not want to be robbed in the time we have with him. But here, this unjust steward, he's thinking, who's going to receive me? So, verse 5, so he called every one of his master's debtors to him. All those in the houses, all those that he knows, owes the master. What, what do you owe? What do you owe? So he's thinking, what I'm going to do is I'm going to strategize and I'm going to at least get back my boss something. I'm going to at least get back something my, my boss owes. I haven't been doing my job. I haven't been chasing after the debtor. I haven't been making sure that money's coming in. You know what? The, manage, the, the ministry team, they have a responsibility here to be stewards of the money that comes in the offering bags. They have a responsibility to manage that. We talk about that membership class. That when you give to missions, that money's going to go to missions. When you give to the storehouse, that money's going to go to the storehouse. They have to be good stewards. You know what? There are a lot of churches where the stewardship has not been good. They've been buying things they didn't have money for. They've been doing crazy things. And now they're in major, major, major debt. And major problems. But stewardship shoes. Here, the, the steward made some poor decisions. He was not making sure the households were, were paying what was due. So he goes to them. How much do you owe the master? Verse number 6. And he said, a hundred measures of oil. So the steward said to him, take your bill, sit down, and quickly write 50. Half. Something's better than nothing. This guy's resourceful. He's thinking on his feet. He's trying to, to he probably realizes that 100 measures of oil is too expensive for the, for the person to come back right away, but we need half. Write 50. Pay back something. Pay back, because he'd been, he'd been robbing God. Whether his hand was in the till or he was not enforcing the things stewards are supposed to do, and the Bible doesn't tell us, but whatever, he was incompetent in his job, and he was robbing from his master. But if he, if he can get back a little bit, that's something. How much do you owe? Verse 6, and he said, 100 measures of oil. And he said, and take your bill and sit down and quickly write 50. Verse 7, then he said to another, and how much do you owe? So he answered, 100 measures of wheat. And he said to him, take your bill and write 80. Now at this time, uh, wheat was, was less expensive than oil. Okay, so that's why there's an increase from 50 to 80. A little bit more, but it was a little bit less to get more, if you will. Be kind of like, you know... Um, buying penny candy, a penny, and then buying a whole candy bar for a dollar, okay? You get 100 pieces of penny candy, but you only get one candy bar. You still, you know, you guys understand that economic piece. Okay, but take back, take your bill and write 80. Verse 8, so the master commended the unjust steward because he had dealt shrewdly. So here we have a change. The, 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 the master's mind is changing. He sees to where the unjust steward is doing what he's supposed to have been doing the whole time. Anybody in business would say, I'd rather get some money than no money. Okay? I mean, anybody in business would rather get that, especially in hard times. And Jesus, of course, is living. This is roughly 30 A.D. He's living during a different... They're going to understand this principle. Okay? And here, the, 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 the steward goes from being fired to being commended. You know what, church? Don't you want God to commend you for your love? Don't you want Him to commend you for how you're being a steward of your body, which is a temple of the Holy Spirit? Church, don't you, don't you desire to please God with your life? I do. Maybe I'm the only one here, but I do. God, I'm yours. Like Isaiah, here I am, Lord, use me. I belong to you. That's what God's looking for. And church, I will tell you, we have folks that come in these seats week in and week out. One moment say yes, the next moment say no. That's not good in business. That's not good in a relationship. I would not have the marriage I have today, the most wonderful wife in the world, 13 plus years. I proposed to her February 14th, 1999, Valentine's Day. Supposed to have been in a nice restaurant, it turned out to be in Walmart, but that's for another day. <laughs> but I tell you what, church, if I told my beautiful wife, if I said, honey, I love you, and the next moment I said, honey, I'm not sure. If I said, honey, I'm committed to you, and the next moment said, honey, I, I, I'm sorry, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to, you know, there's other women out there, other fish in the sea. So, you know, but you're, you're still the apple of mine, but, but, you know, there's other fish. If I said, honey, I'm dedicated to you, 
and the things that you enjoy. And the next moment when she thought I was going to do something, said, uh, well, honey, I, there's other things to do. Somebody else called. I had to help them. I have a feeling our marriage would not be healthy and it may not be existent. I might end up in divorce court. Church, but we do that with God all the time. One moment we say, I'm committed. Lord, I love you. And the next moment we say, Pastor, how can you say that? Do we have to go to Facebook? That's all I, mean, that's all I got to tell people now. Because that's, that's where everything is. We air our dirty laundry for the whole world to see. Language that we use. Actions. Sometimes we even blaspheme the Lord on there. We had that three times the past this past year. One moment someone's praising God, the next moment God doesn't exist. He forgot me. He did all this other stuff. Okay? But here, the, 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 the master, church, he commends. He commends the stewards. Verse 8 again, so the master commended the unjust steward because he had dealt shrewdly. For the sons of this world are more shrewd in their generation than the sons of light. Now church, God of course, Jesus was, doesn't want us to get into this position. We're the sons of the light. Jesus Christ. We shouldn't have to be shrewd every single day. You know, we shouldn't have to, you know, keep revising our way every single day. Choose this day for whom you will serve. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. The book of Joshua. Okay? But you know what, church? It should not have to be. Yes, the, the unjust steward is commended because he got his life right. Now, if the unjust steward can, continues to do this, now we're not sure. Jesus doesn't continue the parable. But we're not sure. To where if he returns back to the unjust behavior, I have a feeling the master's not going to put up with that too long. And out of a job you go. However, church, if we're in a place to where we need the grace of God today, if we need the mercy of God today, there's a place here at this altar today for you. But don't take advantage of it. Don't just say, well, I'll be shrewd. I'll get what I need today, and then I'll get, I'll get tactful. I'll get political. I'll get shrewd. I'll turn around. And you know, God, me and God, that's just how me and God operate. No. The book of Galatians says God's grace will not abound. Church, that works in relationships, but for how long? You know, more people have more relationships now. You can't tell who they're going out with. They date here, they date there. I mean, it's always somebody new, even with marriages. It's gotten so bad in Maine. In Maine, you know what? Somebody can only get married five times. It's a question now I have to ask. How many times have you been married? They've been married five times or more. I cannot marry them in this state. Because we just flipping, flipping spouses like we change our socks. Okay, it doesn't work. You have, you have to go over to New Hampshire. You do. It's the law. It's the law. But here, church, he's commended. He's commended. But don't think, well, I can do this too. I can just keep returning back old, new, old, new, old, new. No, you can't. God is not to be mocked. I pray everybody understands that. God is not to be mocked. Verse number 9 and I say to you, make friends for yourselves by unrighteous mammon. And when you fail, they may receive you into an everlasting home. Those that make friends by unrighteous and worldly things, you will fail. You will eventually hit the wall. The truth will eventually find itself out. You can only back yourself into a corner for so long and then you, either, you have to come forward because there's no place to go. You can run, but you cannot hide. In church here, Jesus is saying they will fail. If you love, the, if you love worldly things, it's going to catch up with you eventually. It's going to catch up with you. It's going to borrower is a slave to the lender. And here, it's going to catch up, church, unless we start to make some changes. Turn things around. Flip the coin. Let's get serious with God. It's the same thing with a relationship. Until you make a change, your relationship's in trouble. Until I got rid decided to get rid of the TV, my marriage was in trouble until 2002. February 16th. It's almost 2002. It's almost been 11 years. This week, it'll be 11 years on Saturday since I got rid of television in my house. They won't have it anymore either, by the way. But God, that's, how, that's what God, God means business. Jesus means business. But failing will come. And you'll also receive your everlasting hope. Yeah. 
we have to be, people are falling away from the faith all the time. Once loved the Lord, I gave it back. Wailing and gnashing of teeth, Jesus would say. I want us to love the Lord. Yeah, when we mess up, Lord, I'm sorry. And desire to do what's right. Rather than going the wrong road over and over and over and over and over. I say, Pastor, why are you sharing like this today? Because I'm very concerned. I'm greatly concerned, church. I don't want to see anybody fall away. I don't want to see anybody turn from the faith. I don't want to see anybody's name, you know, in the paper for being arrested or, or being uh, beaten up or, uh, or being, you know, even fatally uh, destroyed. I don't want to see any of that. Church, let's love God. Let's love God. Verse number 10. He who is faithful in what is least is also faithful in much. So even if you're here, so you're not flipping the coin. I don't have much. You be faithful with the little things you have. Even if that's just the clothes on your back and the place where you call home, you be faithful with little. God will be great. You know what? You know what? You know, let me just get real frank with you. I realize we live in a very repressed area. It's difficult around here. I understand that. But I tell you what, church, until our mindset changes, until we say, you know what? God's going to bless, but I need to be faithful this little bit. And God's going to give more. I believe if we flip the coin and we take that mindset, our town's going to turn upside down. We're not being faithful at least. We're not being faithful with the little things. We take the little things and rather than invest it or rather than buy food with it, we go over and play lottery. I wonder how many are gambling today down at the casino in Oxford. Church, you say, Pastor, how can you say that? Well, let me tell you something, church. From a member in the church, they turned in, they, the, in their offering bag, they turned in a receipt that was that was bought, the date was a Sunday, a $5 award, wanted me to send it in and turn it in for their time. Yeah! So return to sender on this, and I didn't have to give it to the postman. I just said, sorry, this is not, we're not taking this. I'm not going to a casino to redeem your $5 ticket. But church, that's what we do. We get we get a little bit, we get a little bit, and then we, we think, well, well, I'm gonna go buy a lottery ticket. This could be the big day. Yeah. And you know what? 80% of the folks that win the lottery go bankrupt because they're not good stewards of the little. Okay, and they blow it anyway. Alright, so, and this is important stuff. Jesus is calling a spade a spade here. He who is faithful in what is least is also faithful also in much. Church, if you're good stewards with little, you say, Pastor, I'm starting from the, I'm starting from scratch, from ground zero. Hey, God's given me two hands. We'll start right there with those two hands. You can't get any hum more humble than that. So many people come into my office or come into the pastor, this is all I got. Okay, well then you're in a good position. The little things you have. It's not much responsibility, I understand. But don't blow it even with the little things. That's good stewardship. Here Jesus shifts from the, from the unjust steward, but he starts giving his disciples. Remember, he's speaking to his disciples. He's giving them some, some words to live by, if you will. He who is faithful in, in, he who is faithful in what is least is faithful also in much. He who is unjust in what is least is unjust also in much. You know what, church? You know what generation that built America? It's the builder's generation. Dave back there's generation that built America. Those folks knew how to work. There was no government to rely on. They worked with their hands. Blood, sweat, and tears. They invested for years before they had a big home. They lived in small houses with five or six kids up in there, sharing bedrooms and all that. They worked for everything and ate and lived off a of salad. And beans and rice. And what they lived off of was probably grown out in their backyard. And, there, and you, know what they, you know what happened though? When we went down from the builders to the boomers, all those characteristics were lost. Because the builders, the, the builders had built everything and just gave things to their kids. Because it was there. And now look at what we have. Our poor, our poor in America have cell phones. With our tax dollars. Yep. Yep. How things change. You go into a house where it's deemed poor, but they got a 55-inch screen, big screen TV up in there. How does that happen? 
But church, the builder's generation in America, they understood how to start with nothing because the Great Depression, 1929, they didn't have nothing. My grandmother raised 12 kids. Nothing. But they had an integrity that was something that's priceless and is as rare as a $2 bill in today's society. Church, we need to get back to that. That's a biblical principle. You have little, but if you're faithful with little, God's going to raise it up. If you're not faithful even with little, you can forget it. What profit a man to gain the whole world but lose his own soul? And church, it's, it, this is the Word of God. This is not just justice. This is more specific. the Word of God, but Jesus speaking here. Jesus preaching to His disciples. He who is faithful in what is least is also faithful in much, and he who is unjust in what is least is unjust also in much. Verse 11, Therefore, if you have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, will you commit to your trust? Will you commit to your trust the true riches? Rhetorical question. True riches. The Bible says Jesus said to lay up our treasures on heavenly things, not of this world. People, when I, when Mary and I bought our new car last summer, it was a 2002. When I said I bought a new car, they thought I got a 2012 or 2013. And then I said, no, I bought a 2002 Impala. We paid cash. There's no interest. Somebody didn't want interest to get none. How'd you do that? Was the same day for the same no interest for 90 days? I said, no. We went in and we owned the car. How about that? Forget that. I'm not buying no $40,000 car I can't afford. Well, you could have got an interest. You could have got a loan. I don't care about riding in style. I care about being debt free. And church, here, what, what's going to be our true riches? God and our love for God or the man into the world. Who rules the world? Satan. He's the father of life. Who has the final say? God. Verse 12, and if you have not been faithful, and what is another man's who will give you what is your own? Goes back to the time card. Goes back to our taxes. Working for someone else. If you haven't been faithful, God's not going to bless that behavior to where you're going to have your own things. You'll keep you'll keep living from week to week or from renting. And, and we have we have folks church that move more in six months. They're in one place and just all over the place because they don't pay their rent. They get evicted, go to the next place, they go to the next place, they go to the next place. All over. What does that do to their testimony? It's destroying their testimony. Destro you know what? I have rent center call me. I have landlords call me for a reference. And I tell people, sorry, I cannot give you a good reference. If I've helped you move four times, there's no way I'm telling that landlord that you're a good tenant. I'm not lying for you. Had one got upset with me three months ago. Pastor, I expected a good recommendation. Yeah, you put me down. Well, what? You know, you put me down. I'm not lying for you. Why did you move? If, if you had moved because, you know, you had somebody after you or if it really was a bad landlord. But if, you, if you're moving because you're not paying your rent, you're buying drugs with it. If you're, you know, buying everything else under the sun but not paying your rent, I'm sorry. I'm not giving you a good recommendation. No way. It's not flying. Forget that. My sister would say, that's for the birds to feed upon. Verse 12, and if you have not been faithful in other man's, who will give you? What is yours, your own? You know what, church? I pray. God does have plans to prosper us. Doesn't mean you're going to get rich quick or have all these things. But I pray you're going to have some. You're going to have some things that do belong to you. <coughs> Owe no man anything. The only thing we're to be in debt to is Christ. The Bible says. But church, we can, we can still own some things. And something that we can own is something called integrity. Something we can own is something called a love, a deep love for God. God, the old song in the garden, and He walks with me, and He talks with me. But it's because of that deep love for God. You know what, church? I believe, husbands, let me get real frank with you. If you have a deep love for God, you're going to have no, there's going to be no final result other than to have a deep love for your spouse. 
I think if we fix some things, guys, if we fix some things with God, He'll take care of the things with our spouses. Pastor, how do you know? Because it happened to me. 2002, I'll tell you right now, I was not a pretty thing. And I was a deacon in the church, Sunday school, BGMC coordinator. My brother called me the king fundraiser. You know, I was raising money off of me. I mean, all that, but you know what? Our spouses know who we are, don't they? They know who we are. Ladies, it works the same for you. You know, let's give the guys a bad rap. Ladies, it works the same for you. If you love God, go take care of the problems. Kids, young people, you love God, he'll take care of some problems. Jesus is right for what's wrong in our life. But they have that deep, overwhelming love for God. Last verse, and this is probably everybody knows this verse. No one can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and man. Jesus here, as we break this verse down, we're about finished. No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate God, and love mammon. You say, Pastor, why are you using this word? I'm using this word because when Jesus finished the verse, he used God, then mammon. Okay, so I'm taking his list of priority here. Or, or else he will be loyal to God and despise. The, uh, the world. Or you can flip flop them, entertangle them. Basically, Jesus says, You can't one moment be on my team and the very next moment be on the enemy's team. Choose this day for whom you will serve and for whom you will love. Church, if your relationship's bad, you think, Well, I'll just buy my wife a big box of candy. You know, and if, and, if, and if I was in the doghouse with my wife, I could even say, honey, I'll buy you another horse. And that would, but I'll tell you what, that wouldn't even work. Because there would have to be a true repentance. There would have to be a change. We could come up in the church. We could even partake of the cup and drink of the bread. But if we're not right, an overwhelming love. Nothing else matters. Because Jesus said you can't serve to. You can't love God and world. Church, we're known by fruits. The truth is setting itself out. It's setting people free, yes. But the truth is finding itself out, too. Every Saturday night at prayer meeting, the end. I'll walk these altars and doing it for four and a half years. Whether it was here, the Ronell, or the old place. But I would walk the altar. And I would say, Lord, work these altars. But then I would say, Lord, who loves you? Who loves you? And then the Lord many times would give me people to pray for through a word of discernment, a word of knowledge to start praying for. So I ask you the question, who loves God as the Lord wants us to? Brandon, last slide. Who will you love more than anything? God or God? Father, thank you for your word here tonight, today, Lord. Your word is so faithful. Your word is ever true. And Lord, we consider it a great joy and privilege to be loved by the God of the universe. And Lord, you're in a place to where you are ready to receive us just as we are. But Lord, you desire us to make a change. And maybe there's somebody here, Lord, that does not know you as Lord and Savior of their life. And Lord, they need to make a change. Just as the unjust steward realized his sin, realized his difficulty, realized his place, he was about to be fired. And he changed things around to the point of being commended by his master. 
And Lord, maybe there's somebody here and they realize they need a Savior. Before, or they realize before they can worship God, they have to know God. <coughs> personally. And Lord, you're giving an invitation here today. And Lord, if there's somebody here, may they admit they're a sinner. Lord, may they believe, Jesus, that you died on the cross for their sin. Lord, may they confess you as Lord and Savior of their life. And Jesus, you took things a step further. You called folks publicly to declare you so that you could declare them before our Father in heaven. So Lord, if there's somebody here that says, I'm ready to meet Jesus, Lord, they're not going to be embarrassed, they're not going to be shamed. We just want to rejoice with the angels of heaven, even if one, hundreds of angels will rejoice at a new name written down in glory. So if there's somebody here, Lord, may they rise and come. Lord, if there's someone here and they've gone astray, Lord, they know they're not where they're supposed to be with you in the love department. Lord, or maybe in the dedication department or the faithful department. Lord, maybe a tragedy happened. Maybe something difficult happened. And, and Lord, they have just went, went away from you. But Lord, they hear your voice. Because Lord, your word says the sheep know the voice of their shepherds. And Lord, you're ready for them to come home. 